Father, we come to you on this Lord's Day to once again honor and worship you and give you the glory and honor it's due to you. <clears throat> we thank you, Lord, that what you do for us each and every day. We just pray, Lord, that you uh, answer unspoken requests and that you just be with each and every one of us, put that hedge around us and keep the evil away from us, Lord. And, and Father, just uh, protect the innocent and, and go after the unjust. And, and that, Father, we just pray that this nation and the individuals in it would be convicted of their sins and, and that they'll turn from their wickedness. And if not, then you'll destroy them, Lord. And so, Father, we just pray that this Bless this service. Be with each and every one, just uh, though, whether they're here or listening online. And we just pray, Lord, that you continue to look after those preachers that are out there making a bold stand for you in the King James Bible. And they're out there trying to win souls. And so, Father, we just pray that this the leaders, that they'll realize that they're following the wrong God. They're all following Satan rather than following you. And that, and Father, that's both parties, and you know that. And that I still believe that that uh, bridge collapsed, that that was all part of your plan, that you're done with the United States of America, this eclipse that's coming up. And, you know, you put the X on this nation, this nation is doomed. And, uh, and it rightly deserves to be doomed because it won't repent and you've given it all kinds of chances. And so it literally take a miracle from you. But, you know, we, we mess around with Israel. Less than 24 hours later, the bridge happens and all this other stuff happens. And it continues to happen. We mess with Israel, which our satanic leader wants to do and continues to do. Then we rightly deserve to be punished. And Lord, and I pray you do keep punishing the United States, that it needs to be destroyed if it doesn't want to repent. And so, Father, I just pray that you be with this service. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to be continuing to look at our... We start, started last week the study on the seven utterances by Jesus on the cross. You know, we were looking at that for Resurrection Day, and we didn't get finished or whatever, but I want to quickly just review a couple things before we continue on. But remember, I said that these seven utterances by Jesus, then they were significant and show his love for people and his deity. You know, they weren't just some random words or anything else he said, and it wasn't, you know, why did he only say you know, seven phrases. Why didn't he not say eight or nine? Why did he not say four or five or whatever? And so it, uh, you know, they all had a purpose behind them. And I mentioned that the first three were showing his compassion, dealing with the, the people. And then the other four were about himself. You know, that he, he made sure that the people, you know, the sinners, remember he came, that's the whole purpose why Jesus came to the cross came to earth but so that he could die on that cross take our place on, on the cross for, for our sins it um you know he, he made sure that you know he, he's more concerned about the sinners than he was about himself you know and i briefly mentioned some of the stuff that all the things that he'd gone through before he ever went to the cross you know how he had you know had all these false trials against him you know got spit in his face his beard ripped out crown of thorns put on, on his head got you know, scourged, you know, the flesh ripped off him and all this, that had to carry the cross, you know, stumbled, fell on his face with that. And, you know, all these things that I said that, you know, he had such severe injuries that normally any normal person would have already been dead. You know, he had a chance to get crucified. And, I, it, and you know, certainly not be one of those things that, that uh, he'd be able to scream out. I mean, because of what he was on the cross, he'd have to kind of help pick himself up to be able to breathe and different things. You know, and that was from a medical doctor. I've read that before. And that, um, you know, like I said, he shouldn't even barely been able to even talk, let alone we're going to see later on he's going to shout out. You know, so again, it shows that God was fully in control of all this, you know, that Jesus has God. And, you know, so we, we see the significance of these things. And I mentioned how that Jesus, you know, one of the things he's going to say is it's finished, you know, that, that the Roman Catholic Church, they try to... Keep, you know, through mass, they have they crucified Jesus over and over and over again. Well, Jesus did it once and once for all. You know, Hebrews tells us that numerous times and so forth. So we looked at the first utterance was in Luke 23, chapter 23, verse 34, where Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And, you know, this was when, as I said, the people were all, 
uh, gambling over his raiment, you know, the clothing that Jesus had on, you know, of course, you know, the, the very creator of the world, they go and they put him up on the cross, buck naked, and they, um, you know, it just shows you how, the, you know, the, how wicked these people were. You know, they go and they, they uh, were gambling his clothes, but with robe, they didn't want to, you know, tear apart, you know, so they're gambling over it. And, you know, so we see, that, you know, just the, the idea that, you know, they're in their minds like, oh, he doesn't need these clothes anymore. He's going to die anyway. You know, there's just another way of them trying to mock their very creator. And so we saw we saw that. And then we, we saw uh, where the second utterance was was made by Jesus also in Luke. Uh, uh, it's in Luke chapter 23, verse 43. So it's just the numbers reversed at 34 to 43. And on this one, Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. And this was again about the Christian who was, uh, you know, the, the, the one thief on the cross who gets saved. You know, he finally realized, you know, in the beginning he was sitting there mocking Jesus along with the other thief and all the other people. But then he finally realized, hey, this really is the Son of God next to me. And, you know, he repents and he gets saved. You know, the other thief ends up, and it's still burning in hell, and we'll, we'll spend eternity in the lake of fire. But so we see that the first one, Jesus was concerned about the lost. You know, he was concerned about, you know, Father, forgive these these uh, sinners here, you know, the, the unsaved here, these these Roman soldiers and stuff. <clears> that <throat> they didn't, they didn't, you know, they didn't realize that they were crucifying the Creator. And then, you know, here we see compassion for a a new believer that he wants to comfort them that with knowing that, hey, he says, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. You know, that he would be with Jesus, you know, because the thief had said, when you come in your kingdom, you know, the verse before, whatever, and then Jesus is like, you know, we don't need to wait till then. You will be with me today. And so, you know, Jesus wants believers to understand that when you get saved, he comforts you right away. You know, he doesn't wait and like, okay, well, we'll get around to it whenever I have time or, you know, a thousand years from now or whatever or something. You know, he just... You know, immediately when you get saved, now I'm not saying everything goes perfect in your life or, or um, you know, you're not going to have troubles. Trust me, the more you walk with the Lord, the more troubles you're going to have. But <clears throat> you do have that true comfort that you can never get without Jesus, you know, or at least the security anyway, that even if they take your life, you know, we see that in other countries all the time, especially. <clears throat> but if they take your life, you know you're secure in your in your salvation that you're gonna you still go to heaven. So you know it's not really an issue of you know that kind of thing. But let's look at um, you know so we see that's the first two things where he was concerned about the people. You know first the unsaved and then a, a new believer. But the third utterance by Jesus on the cross is found in John chapter 19 verses 26 and 27. So go ahead and turn there to John <laughs> chapter 19 verse 26 through 27. This is two separate statements, but they go together and would have only been seconds apart as Jesus looked at the people spoken to. Now, even if he wanted to count them as separate so that Jesus spoke eight sayings, then we still see how the number eight means new beginning, and a person can only have a true new beginning or be born again by receiving Jesus as their Savior. You know, remember I said that the number seven means completeness. And, you know, so Jesus made those, you know, those statements. He was complete, you know, what he had done. He was finished. But like you said, even if you said, well, you know, he really made two here, you know, it was still the same sentence. He just didn't, you know, you know, they make it different, but it's, it's, it's one sentence, you know, even though it's two verses, it, you know, it's like if I'm saying something, I say something and then I stop and then I look over to the next person and I continue saying it. It's still one statement. So, but even if you counted them as two, then, you know, I said <laughs> the number eight still shows that, that uh, being born again is that new believer, you know, which only comes through, Je you know, receiving Jesus as your savior. Well, let's look at John chapter 19, verses 26 through 27. So John chapter 19, verses 26 through 27. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple standing by, <clears throat> whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her unto his own home. So, you know, you see, it's obviously, he's, you know, he's first looking at Mary and he's saying, woman, 
Behold thy son. You know, look over there. there that's your son. And then he turns around and looks at John. And he says, you know, that, that uh, behold thy mother. You know, so he's telling him, look, you know, Mary is now, now your mother. You know, so in other words, he's telling John you need to take care of him. But, you know, it's all one statement. You know, just because it's in two verses, it's still, it's the same statement. You know, he didn't stop and then a bunch of time passed. I mean, literally, it's like, just like I did. He looks at her, says the statement, and then turns around, looks at John, and then finishes the statement. You know, it's all one statement. But Jesus made this third utterance, this third utterance, as he fulfilled his obligation as the oldest son to take care of his mother, since his stepdad Joseph was dead. It was the obligation in Jewish law for the oldest son to take care of his mom. Now Jesus did this, but now he was dying. You know, so. You know, Jesus did take care of Mary, you know, while he was he was alive, but he knew that now he was going to die. So he had to make sure that uh, somebody would take care of her. And as the perfect son, he did not fail to fulfill his obligation, even at a time of great suffering. So, you know, Jesus sits there and he's suffering greatly here, but he was still concerned not only for the unsaved and then for this new believer, but now he's concerned you know, showing, you know, I, I got to fill my obligation as the oldest son. I got to still take care of my, my, my mom. And so, you know, he does that. He makes sure that, you know, he, and of course he knew that John was going to, you know, he was not going to get martyred. All the other apostles were going to get martyred. Now, John did get persecuted and they tried to kill him, but God didn't allow it, you know, but he, he ended up living to a ripe old age. So he would have outlived Mary. And so, you know, he, you know, he knew that, John would be the one that he could take care of her because, you know, the other ones were going to die. And then back in the same situation again where she's not being taken care of. So, again, we see there that, you know, God in his omnipotence, then, you know, Jesus is God in his omnipotence. And he made sure that it was John that, that took care of her. Not only that, but he made sure that John stayed alive, you know, when they tried to boil him in oil and everything else. And he still kept him alive. <clears throat> now... <clears throat> So, like I said, so keep this in mind. You know, he's making all these statements, even though he, I mean, he's suffering on this cross here. But now when Jesus makes these sayings, he is looking at both Mary and John. And it is then that he looks at Mary and says, woman, behold thy son. As I said, he then immediately after the saying to John, and he turns to John and says, behold thy mother. You know, so that's, I said, it's all one statement here. You know, and this uh, fulfills ob Jesus obligation to making sure Mary is taken care of now a woman a widow at that time needed to be taken care of it was the oldest son's responsibility but not but now Jesus was going to die so he tells John to take care of her you know so Jesus always fulfilled the obligation now he fulfilled the letter of the law right to the you know the, the law right to the last letter you know everything was was a hundred percent and you know, even this year, Jesus looked after his mom. Now, remember that Jesus' brothers were not saved yet, and you never place the hands of a believer into the care of the unsaved. You know, so you notice he didn't go and tell James was the next oldest son after Jesus. And Jesus didn't say, hey, James, you know, you need to start taking care of Mary now. No, you don't put a believer in the responsibility of the unsaved. You never do that. And Jesus is showing that example. You know, his brothers did get saved later on. Of course, some of them got martyred as well. You know, James did, for starters. But we, um, you know, at the time, they were not saved. You know, you don't place the, the care of a, of a believer in the hands of the unsaved. Now, as I said, Jesus also knew that all of the disciples and even his brothers would be martyred. But John would outlive Mary. You know, so again, you know, in his omnipotence, he, you know, he, so there's a couple of reasons why, again, that's also why he didn't choose one of the other brothers as well. Now, he again was making sure Mary had care until her death. If he had placed her under the care of another disciple, then when he died, Mary would have been without care again. So for the third time, Jesus placed the welfare of others before himself. You know, this time Jesus looked after saved people. As Jesus said, he would never leave them or forsake them. You know, Jesus does not forget us once we are saved. John tells us in his gospel how Jesus loved people until the end. 
Jesus loved his mom, Mary, and John was called the disciple whom Jesus loved. You know, we, we see that. We're going to look at that in a minute here. But we see that Jesus, you know, he looked after his mom no matter what. You know, he wasn't about to, uh, you know, forget her or anything like that. And so, you know, we, we see here how, you know, in all this suffering, he still takes care of people. But he don't, he doesn't, like, once you get saved, you know, he doesn't just, okay, well, I got, you're, you're saved, right? You're on your own now, you know, you're, I'll see you in heaven. You know, he takes, he says he will never leave us or forsake us. So, you know, he takes care of us. And we need to remember that, that, um, you know, we, are that, we have that security there. Well, let's turn to John chapter 13, verse 1, if you would. John chapter 13, verse 1. John chapter 13 and verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. You know, so we see there that Jesus loved them right up to the very end. You know, what even when he... he uh, you know, he was sitting there dying on the cross. He he still thought about not only the unsaved, but like I said, a new believer and, and making sure that, you know, Mary, you know, that she'd been a believer. But he, he making sure that she was still taken care of and all this kind of stuff. So, you know, that, that shows what kind of man Jesus was. Now, Jesus probably made this utterance near the end of the first three hours on the cross. On the cross. He knew Mary and John were saved, and this is why his first two utterances were for the lost, with the second to a man who was calling out to him. You know, Jesus will not hear the call of a sinner calling him in. Jesus will never not hear the call of a sinner calling him in true repentance. You know, so if, if, if someone unsaved, like this, this uh, thief here, if he truly repents and he calls out to Jesus, Jesus will hear you. You know, he's not going to call the people that, you know, they pretend to be saved. You know, they go up to the altar, do an altar call, or they do this, or, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm saved, pastor, or whatever. You know, but then you never see them again and do anything else. And, you know, like I said, their lives, nothing changes or whatever. You know, they might think they're fooling us, and they could even fool me or, or everybody here or anybody else, but they're never going to fool Jesus. You know, they're not going to fool Jesus, you know, and, and I'm usually pretty good to judge on knowing when people are not really truly saved anyway. They want to sit there and and, you know, the Bible clearly says you can know them by their fruits. And you can see very much some of these people that they're not saved. But, you know, Jesus will call out. I mean, if somebody truly calls out to him, he will save that individual. Now, the fourth utterance by Jesus on the cross is found in Matthew chapter 27, verse 46. So turn to Matthew chapter 27, verse 46. So we saw the first three were dealing with People, you know, Jesus was putting people before himself. But now these last four are going to be about, Jesus is going to be thinking about himself now. Now he, first, he thought about the other people, you know, the unsaved, a new believer, and a, and a individual who, you know, his mom and stuff like that, and one a believer that had been a believer for a while. But now he's going to start thinking about himself. So look at Matthew chapter 27, verse 46. Matthew chapter 27, verse 46. And about the ninth hour... Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I mean, before we move on to this verse, I just meant it was something I wanted to make a comment on this other with Mary. That uh, we saw, you know, before, like I said, go back to one with Mary there. Don't have to turn there, but for there in John where he's saying, you know, woman, behold thy son. And then. You know, he, you notice he doesn't call her mom or he doesn't call her whatever. He calls her woman, you know, because the Roman Catholic Church and God knew this, that they try to claim that Mary is the mother of God. She's not the mother of God. She's mother of the earthly Jesus as the man, but she is not the mom of Jesus as God. Jesus as God has always existed and has in fact, is the one that created Mary, who was used as his mom or just the vessel for him coming in the flesh. So she's she's the mom of him as a man in the flesh, but not she's not the mom of God. You know, the mother of God, as the Roman Catholic Church says. 
you know, and, and Jesus knew that. And that's another reason why he called her woman, not, you know, mother or something like that, you know, because she, um, you know, she's not the mother of God. She's the mother of Jesus as the man, you know, the God man or whatever. But anyway, so I just want to quickly bring that up. But, you know, back here, so back here in Matthew chapter 27, verse 46, let me read that again. And about the ninth hour, which is around, you know, 3 p.m., Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, these last four utterances will pro were probably made during Jesus' last three hours on the cross. You know, the first three were probably the first half, and these three <coughs> were in the second half, and probably more of them all near, closer to the end, you know, probably more, you know. But um, in these last four utterances by Jesus, he now turns his concern to himself, already having taken care of the lost and his mom. Now, Jesus calls out with a loud voice and asks why God has forsaken him. You know, it says right there, he cried out with a loud voice. Remember I said that, you know, he shouldn't even be hardly even able to talk and stuff, let alone be able to, you know, call out in his loud voices and stuff. But he calls out with a loud voice and asks, you know, why has God forsaken him? Remember, it was, you know, from the last three hours, from noon till three, that's when there was darkness upon the, the whole world. Because that's when God had forsaken him, you know, and, and so, you know, this was probably made shortly after the beginning, you know, like after a little bit after noon or whatever, when, when uh, the last three hours would have started. The first three statements were before that. Now, the fact that Jesus is able to call out with a loud voice shows how Jesus was in control of his death. No mere man could have done what Jesus did. You know, we know the thief on the cross was able to talk, but number one, he hadn't been beaten the way Jesus had. But he also, it never says he talked out with a loud voice or anything else. You know, he probably was like, you know, remember me, Lord, when, you know, when, when you come in your kingdom. You know, I'm sure he wasn't, you know, a loud voice. But also, like I said, he hadn't been had the beatings and the scourgings and all the other stuff that, that Jesus had endured beforehand either. So, but God had to forsake Jesus, even though he was his only begotten son, because Jesus bore the sins of the world. And Jesus and, and God cannot look at sin, even if it is his only begotten son. Now, this was the last time. This sorry, this was the time when darkness was upon the world because of this. You know, that's why I said, well, go. You know, that you can find that in Luke there. But Jesus was fulfilling prophecy with his utterance. Now, even in his suffering, Jesus takes the time to fulfill prophecy as he will in his next utterance as well. You know, so Jesus, like I said, he makes sure takes care of his mom to fulfill the law. Now he's going to fulfill prophecy. He's got all this suffering going on, but he still fulfills prophecy. We're going to see that in, you know, the, these different statements here. So we, um, you know, we see that Jesus, you know, he, he did everything that he was supposed to do. But Jesus takes the time to fulfill prophecy as he will in his next utterance as well. Now, Psalm 22 is a messianic psalm. If you would turn to Psalm 22, verse 1. So Psalm 22, verse 1. Okay, Psalm 22, verse 1. Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? So Jesus in his suffering was calling out to God and asking him why he had forsaken him. You know, we too should be calling out to God. You know, that's the problem. Nobody ever calls out to God. And they... Um, you know, Jesus, obviously, this is the man talking here. You know, you know, why is my, you know, obviously he is God. So he was not referring, this isn't the deity part of him speaking. This is the man part of him speaking, saying, you know, why, you know, have you, for, you know, forsaken me, God? You know, we're talking about God the Father. You know, why have you forsaken me? Or even, you know, God the Holy Ghost. You know, why have you guys forsaken me? And so, uh, you know, that's, that's just, that was his man side of him. 
But, you know, he, he knew that, you know, what he should do. He knew he needed to call out to God. That's what we need to do. You know, people that, you know, we don't, we don't, you don't run away from God in like that situation. You, you call out to God. But the fifth utterance by Jesus on the cross is found in John chapter 19, verse 28. So John chapter 19, verse 28. I don't know. We might just uh, finish this up. I have to go next week because we still got a lot left here. So why don't we? Uh, we'll look at the last three next week, and, and uh, we'll have to. You know, we'll look at the fifth one next week. So we, we'll look at John nineteen twenty eight. That's where it'll be. If you, you know, you can look it up during the week. But like I said, there's there's too much more left. So we'll um, finish it up next week, and, and we'll go from there. So let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this time you've given us here to look at your utterances Jesus made on the cross. And, and we, we thank you, Lord, for those that, that he He turned to you, Lord, whenever, you know, Father, whenever he um, was suffering, that that's what we need to do. We need to turn to you, Lord, and get closer to you, not run away as most people do. And so, Father, we need to understand that, that you're in control of all situations, even though sometimes doesn't seem that way, we may not understand them all, then we need to trust that for whatever reason you're, you're doing what is you think is best. But just comfort us, Lord, as we go through those situations, because in our frailty, we don't we don't recognize these things and cannot always understand everything. But, but you as God, you know all. And Father, we thank you that, that Jesus didn't forget the unsaved or, or like his mom or anything else, you know, the believers, he doesn't forsake them, even in his time of suffering, that he was still uh, thinking about them over himself. And so, Father, we just pray that for those out there that are listening, if they're not saved, that today might be the day of their salvation and that this world will turn from its sin as it continues to, to slide into wickedness. And so, Father, we just pray that you be with each and every one. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.